four, six, eight usually. So we're getting good attendance, and uh, we just we just been banging on. I've, I've been out the last couple of times now. We're just banging on uh, the goalie fundamentals. We, we tend to do a lot of activity, a lot of motion, a lot of moving, and those are those are sorts of drills that when you incorporate them into your practice on a, on a on a daily basis where we practice regularly. It's a, uh, it's a five, seven, ten minute set that usually occurs at the start of practice when you've got some sort of other team concept building or going on, whether it's, uh, whether it's breakouts or a battle drill that doesn't have any offense. The, the idea is to have five or six minutes where a goaltender can take care of his, move, his movement stuff, his movement work on his own. And typically it's a start of practice, typically it's less than ten minutes because they're going to bore themselves out of their minds. And those sorts of things are, are oftentimes just incorporated within the paint. Rarely you have to get outside the crease to get these things done. And uh, we'll, we'll give some examples when we hit the ice, but typically that's a, that's a way for the goalies to start having goalie movement work when you're moving your team around the ice and some sort of ramped up start to your regular practice. Yeah. Just on that note, do they have to have a crease? No, not necessarily. This is. This is typically movement that would be in the dimension of crease, but you don't necessarily need to crease to work on it. You can be out in the center zone if you're if you're doing end zone stuff. And uh, oftentimes, if you're if you're doing end zone and you've, uh, you've got the luxury of two goalies in your practice, you'll probably have one goalie working in an end zone with a group, and the other goalie might be able to get some of this done out near the red line and blue line. And the one thing I wanted to mention at the outset. We just, we just talked about it a little bit, and I was on the ice a while ago, and uh, I was using a, uh, a Twitter drill that I found to help one of the OHA goaltenders, and uh, it's an unbelievable resource, guys. Uh, oftentimes, you need the visual to support what you hear in terms of what an what a exercise or what a drill looks like for a goaltender. So those, whether it's YouTube or it's Twitter or whether it's some other social media, uh, those are fantastic resources. You're going to find plenty of examples of what you're trying to accomplish with your goaltenders in, uh, in that, those social media spots. So that's, uh, so that's sort of the first five. <coughs> I could probably write down the zones, the work areas that we, we, typically, we typically have. So five, five work areas. Uh, one is puck skills. So this could be incorporated in that first five minutes too. So we've got some movement stuff with a goaltender, positional movement down, up, butterflies, DHs, reverse DHs, things that they do. This can also be incorporated into that first 10 minutes. It, it's, it can be a part of some other parts of your practice as well, whether you've got team concepts, breakouts, or regroups or something. Goalies can be involved in that, but but typically that can be accomplished in the first six or seven minutes. Uh, Foxville stuff. Second area we typically go to now, and this is an area that, that oftentimes is is sort of the bulk of a practice. And this is this is drive plays. So anything that comes up the ice with tempo. So drive generally means attack at the net, and uh, part of drive is lateral work. So, so if you wanted to start talking about drive stuff, it's it's every drill that you use at the beginning of practice, where you're moving down the ice, shooting the puck on goaltenders, you get in the other other side of the ice and go the other way, and uh, you just keep it. Uh, you keep a drill that has some tempo, some some flow to it, and uh, you build off of that. So it's a one on one, obviously, and it's a two on one, and you might incorporate a two on one, and you might even build into three on twos in this in this tempo or energy. And at the start of practice, typically you're trying to create a little tempo, a little energy to get your group started, and those are the those are the traditional drills that really accomplish that for you. Um, a couple of things to guard against. Uh, they're good drills, they're all good drills for goaltenders, but a couple of things to guard against is, is spacing. Uh, you be conscious of repetition. Now, goalies appreciate that this is something to get tempo and get energy into your practice, but at the same time, you've got to find a way to space the shots. 
uh, to give them a chance um, to recover. So drives and laterals are, are typically how you get your practice started and any sort of combinations of one on O's, two on O's, two on ones, three on twos, et cetera, can be incorporated in that starting practice. And that's your heading, that's how you build, that's how you get started. Okay, any questions there? Okay. Three, and this is, uh, this is oftentimes just becomes a bulk of your practice here. It's a uh, cycle. And count power play into those things, sorts of things. And uh, the last one will be traffic scenarios. So that's that's where you get into a great deal more team concept. Is where you probably have more defenders in the group. You probably have more confrontational type of drills, but they're all still valuable. And uh, I think I think what you should be conscious of when these drills are occurring, the puck may only come to the net every 10, 15, 20 seconds, but the the preparation the goaltender is going through in these types of drills is probably of the most value. The, the work to prepare to get to the right place. The saves typically are instinctive, reactive, but the work is involved in preparation and recovery. So all the work occurs as they prepare for the puck to come, and after the save is made, it's recovering, it's potentially a second save, uh, tracking the rebound and, and preparing for the next play. So if, if you get caught up with thinking that more pucks is better, oftentimes you just wear out your goalie in a, in a short course. And if you want a seven or eight minute drill, you might, with, with plenty of pucks, you might wear out the goalie after four or five minutes. So be conscious of the fact that the work for the goaltender in, in terms of a practice is the work part is the preparation and recovery. The saves are just instinctual and reactionary. And uh, they'd stand in one place and make a million saves a day and they'd be happy as can be. But that's not traditionally where all the work is. The work is involved in the adjustment. So drills like this, all these drills where there's some battle element, whether it's the traffic or the power play, where there's some puck movement and you have to incorporate some sort of depth adjustments lateral adjustments, things of that nature, that's the work. That's where we tire them up. And then the example would be a, a one goalie practice we just had a couple of hours ago. A little guy, was, he was a warrior. He gave it everything he had by the 35 or 40 minute mark. He was done. He was absolutely done. And he, he tried to hang in there, but there was nothing left. And, and then the example was when he ended up spending all the time in the zone. Hawks never left the zone. We just had attack drills, we had combat drills, battle drills, tip drills, everything. And just spent all this time around the net. And he gave it his all, but it warm up. So that's, again, um, the work is in the preparation and recovery. And uh, the saves are just instinctive. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay, so we go to four now. And four is. <coughs> Four is a, uh, a little bit of a, how do I say this? Four. I'm going to say what four is. This will be higher than one stuff. Yeah. I, oftentimes I tie it into three, but I, I guess we'll just keep it as a category because it, in, in reality, this is a part of, this is a part of practice that, that is often overlooked. And, and, and I think keeping it as, as its own category is, is probably the way to go. So anything that happens more over the line. So with that in mind, we obviously see the, 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 the cycle power play aspects of this because uh, oftentimes offense is created in those scenarios from the goal line. But also on the rush, on entries, when the, when the puck comes down the ice, there's more times than not where the only lane available to a player coming into the zone is that wide ice. He's driving down the wide ice and he ends up getting below the goal line. That doesn't mean the offense is over when he gets there. It's just another area or opportunity to create offense. And unfortunately, in our, in our practice scenarios, we, we tend to overlook that. We think about in our in our rushes or our, our attack drills, uh, we tend to drive the net, drive the net, drive the net. We, we seldom get it in behind the net where 
a, a great deal of the offense occurs from it. And all you have to do is watch any game, any league, any time, and you'll just start to appreciate how often the puck, the offense begins with the puck below the goal line and the attack the goal line. So this is an area that can be dedicated. Now you can incorporate this in some of this drive stuff. So the examples could be, uh, you know, a 2 one where they they attack the net, but they can't make their offensive play to the net until they touch the goal line. Something that takes them down into that area that they would get to in the game. So that's just a simple uh, uh, drive drill where they have to touch the goal line. And that allows them to have that ability to create new offense from below the goal line. Okay. Tanner, I took her. Tanner, I forgot the fifth zone. Fifth one. What's the fifth one? Because you're just going through. You did two, three, and four. Yeah. What skills you had, right? Then you could add. I guess, I guess the fifth one has always been the movement stuff. It's also been the movement. So it's without a puck. I guess it's, yeah, it's a, you can, we can put it in there. We sort of track it in there. Huh? We we'll track it when you put the movement. And the thing with the feel of the goal line is it gives, it's kind of like those dead angle shots, really, where. You know, you don't expect any to go in, but they still go in, or it's the rebounds they create where goals come off of, so it's good to put some time in to work on it, right? And it's also a different kind of awareness, right? Where when you're up ice, you can see most of the play without turning your head and looking, but once the puck's move below the goal line, you're really going to be active with your head. You're really going to talk to the goaltenders about constant head checks and shoulder checks and try to make them aware of the ice, because once the puck moves, the line a lot of times is the, especially with minor hockey goalies, that's nothing against them, but they they have no awareness of anybody on the ice now. So if the pass goes out, right, they might not have the best adjustment or might be sliding instead of staying on their feet. So I think for that that type of thing as well as just constant reminders of them to keep their head active. So. Yeah. Well, that would be an example of the uh, girls game just and I watched yeah. this weekend. Um, they played a, a little bit different caliber of team in the, in the one team had experienced the, the abilities of the other in terms of passing, uh, misdirection, uh, and, sh and sh our, our goaltender struggled on ice awareness with, with tracking and finding the options and making checks. She struggled with it because she had experienced it. So uh, incorporating it a little more of, of the practice side of things would, would allow for better uh, execution in the game. Okay. So those are the five work areas. Uh, the last one being the movement and the tracking. I uh, sort of touched on that at the outset. That's generally what happens at the meetings in practice with uh, oftentimes no pucks, just movement, just uh, getting the little skating parts in. <coughs> Did you want to touch a little bit on the post play? Do you want to touch a little bit on, on VH or reverse VH? This is sort of the catchphrase right now. Yeah, I think it's yeah. yeah, a lot of times I think it's overused. I think the, the biggest thing is just to. Uh, Teach it as a basic skill, so you know whether you you stand with the face off dot or below the face off dot and, and shoot pucks at the guy and have him be in square on this post or in front of the post and get him comfortable and then get him comfortable moving back. Probably so some repetition where they're having to follow the, the puck or the player back and then just uh, yeah between either one. Like I think it's uh, I don't think it's something that I don't know you, you really need to teach in a minor hockey setting. I think. Most kids that are serious about goal have been to goal camps and probably did 8,000 VHs and reverse VHs and all that. And I think that the worst thing to do is try to put them in those positions sometimes um, where they're, maybe that's not exactly what they want to do, right? They can stay up on their feet. Um, we see more kids even stand up and put their feet together or even butterflies. So I don't think it's really an area you got to teach. I think it's more just doing the repetition and the drills so that they can make their own decisions and build their own instincts with it. So that's what I think. And yeah, I I found, especially with the younger kids, that trying to teach something like that, reverse for you mm -hmm. and all that stuff, they're too small. Oh yeah. And they're they're way too small. small. Right. They're, they're yeah. gonna get it over their head to begin with. Yeah. Or they're just not strong enough to move across. So it's I've such been, an awkward position too, you know, you don't yeah. have a body awareness either, right? Yeah. I've been just telling the kids, stand your feet. Yeah. Or go down, yeah. If it's yeah. slow, go down, if it's high, stand your feet, yeah. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a good point, is that, you know, there's <coughs> age-appropriate movement work for vet, for goaltenders. So we may be talking about banning or bugging some of these type of areas, but in, in reality, the movement stuff 
has got to be appropriate to the age. So if you've got a nine-year-old out there that can just shuffle and tee push, maybe that's all they should be doing. Yeah. And then even with the Bantam Midget, at least the ice times I've been up to, they've all been the goalie coaches, right? So it's almost trying to keep them more close. Sometimes they almost overuse them, right? So you're almost trying to make corrections that way instead of putting them in your trying to get them out of it, right? So, yeah, I don't know if you want to spend much time on it. I think it's just more, again, he says they, uh, the tracking, like tracking, uh, that's, that's a pretty overused word, I think, too, right? But I think allowing your eyes to take you to the puck, I think that just is kind of, <coughs> it'd be common sense, right? Like if someone shoots high, your eyes should take you out. If someone shoots low, your eyes should take you down. If someone shoots to the side, your eyes should take you to the side. So I guess that would be common sense, but that's a well used word. <laughs> right, it's just trying to let him do that, right? You know, let him stand up, let him be relaxed, shoot pucks on him, and have him try to react naturally to it, right? How, where do their eyes take him, right? You know, and then at young kids, like you said, they're so small, they don't cover any of that. So then you're trying to get their legs to fire, their core to fire. Like, the last thing you want to see is a guy using his weakest part of his body waving at it, right? You want to get him to push with his legs, push with his core, and then have his hands kind of activate as he moves into it, right? But I think it's, more just trying to get the legs going, the core going, and the hands going. So, you know, it's a six, seven inch save, everything's firing together, right? It's not just reaching or trying to do a VH or reverse VH or whatever, right? So, yeah. <clears throat> All right, so any other questions about this? We'll just touch on one other aspect, just in a, sort of a preparation recovery um, thing as well. Pretty straightforward. Okay, so we'll just do, uh, just do, I guess I can write it down. Okay, so uh, we'll talk a little bit about preparation recovery. So we have uh, sort of a rule of, uh, applies to to the preparation side. So we we always commented that we want angle stance. Yeah. As the as the order, try and true, hard to argue with it. And so the the process is any time the puck moves, whether it's from a high spot to a post, from a post back up to the perfect shooting spot in the in the slot. The first primary adjustment the goaltender is all going to make is adjust the angle. That's the primary adjustment. And we, we preach time and time again that that's the first thing that happens. So we get to angle, we arrive at angle, we set our stance. The second thing that's critical, get set. And if the situation dictates where we can add some depth to our position, we're gonna go and attempt to add a little depth. Oftentimes, you might get angle and the puck comes. You might be fortunate enough to get angle and stance puck comes and if you're really fortunate it's a slow developing play you might angle stance and depth on, on pucks that are coming in from distance so that's that's the key so on top of that we've, we've really evolved here in the last couple, I think in a couple years now we've added something that's critical to all of this and the, and the first thing we have to do Tyler just touched on it a little bit ago eyes it seems now that the way the game is played, with the kids that come to the net, stand around the front of the net, and they wait for the pucks to come in, and then they bang away. It's absolutely critical that we get our eyes to the puck as often as we can. So at times, we may be sacrificing one of these things to keep our eyes on the puck. But we think we they really succeed the puck are going to improve or increase their chances of stopping the puck regardless of whether they're in the perfect stance with the perfect depth and on the perfect angle. We think that the priority now is to get your eyes in the puck and at times let your athleticism or your competitive spirit take over to make your saves. We still absolutely believe in this process of preparing for shots and if, it, and if, it, if it's a, allowed, we like to do all these things in order, but overall the eyes thing now becomes the priority 
in any sort of drill that's on the ice. If you just take a moment and you watch your goaltender, you'll be able to see whether he keeps his eyes settled on the ice. So if you take a, a two minute window of a shooting drill in a day and just watch the goalie, you'll be able to tell easily whether he holds his eyes on the puck. And the, the body language that you're looking for is sort of that calm, quiet head. The one that you'd be concerned about is goaltenders and critical over the years and I don't think it's actually accurate. It's the flying head. We've, we've historically talked about it. He's a little afraid of the puck. Well, you've seen the equipment that these kids wear today. You can pop them just about it. They don't get hurt anymore. They, they just, it doesn't hurt. So that's not the case anymore. But oftentimes their, their strength or their balance or their agility isn't where it can be. And in order to go to the puck, their eyes fly away. And that's what we see more and more now, is that they may have a desire to go to the puck, but when their eyes fly away, the whole process of making a save speeds up. Everything happens faster when your eyes fly away. When you hold your head still and you keep your eyes on the puck, it tends to slow things down. We've always said the longer you see the puck, the more time it feels like you have to make a save. So we just encourage calming the eyes, slowing the eyes down, slowing the head down, eyes on the puck. And uh, in terms of that, Sort of a pre-shot routine for a goaltender, that's that's what we preach and that's what we believe. There's a great value to that. And it's uh, it's pretty simple to accomplish in a in a practice scenario. Um, again, with good spacing. So and should there should there when you talk about their eyes, should their head be going towards the like moving towards the back or their head turning towards the back or still? What, what we think happens is, the, like you said, the longer your eyes are on the puck, the more time you have to make a save. And we think if your eyes are on the puck, they tend to be a little more patient. They don't flop and drop to make the puck. They may hold an edge just a little bit longer. And as a result of that, they will have that tendency to track the puck with their eyes. And that's what we're encouraging. Follow the puck all the way in. And a great example that we've always preached is a young goaltender will make the save He's tracked it into his glove and it falls up in the air, and sure enough, he's able to find the rebound. Another goaltender that makes the same save and doesn't track the puck and loses the rebound, well, he, he's battling now to find that rebound. And those, those are the ones that typically go in. So, the longer you keep your eyes on the puck, the sensation is that you have more time to make your save. For now, it's the same, but eyes on the puck. If I'm standing up by the blue line and I'm watching my goalie or standing off to the side and watching my goalie and I'm looking for eyes mm -hmm. contact, I can't see his eyes obviously. Right. I'm looking for his head to turn yeah. towards See if he finishes right. track to see the head every time. So if he's putting one off his blocker or his pad, his head is typically going to go to that area. That's that's general. <coughs> when he wants the motion most of the time, right? Like everything he wants to fire that side. A little bit situational, like if you tee it up right there and like, oh, I'm my eyes are going to fight it off, right? And then try to find it. So it is still a little bit situational. And then a lot of stuff Manny does also with the eyes. Um, we spent time on it this summer and with the camps going to is your eyes will give you an idea of what you're going to have as far as angle, stats, and depth also as far as reading the play and reading all the players from the other team up front and any adjustments you might have to make on your post. And also with your own team reading contact points or different places of pocket hit even coming through on your own team defensemen and stuff like that. So, you know, same thing if like if Andy's in, in front of me and he's the only player in front and he slides to the back where my eyes are going to tell me that I'm going to make an adjustment to my angle. My eyes are going to tell me that I'm going to deeper my stance and separate. And my eyes are going to tell me that that backdoor play I'm going to add no gap. I'm basically going to get to the post where if he moves around and walks up in front of me, my eyes are going to tell me where my angle is, they're going to tell me I've got to tighten up because they're going to get around my feet. They're going to tell me I can probably get to at least mid depth in my crease with a strong shuffle. So the eyes to the puck, but just making sure you don't forget the eyes to the play too. So you're taking in all that information. I know the younger kids you probably don't want to spend any time on with, like just focus on the puck. But I think it's good on certain things to work on is just get them aware that they got to see what's going on with the other team and, and uh, with their own teammates as well, right? so that they can make those adjustments 
and then even the stance with uh, you know people like now sometimes they're standing up straight sometimes they're they're deep in their stance like this it's kind of that's almost went back to a little bit more old school in the last few years how deep guys get so i guess too is not being too carried away on that like you can you should be able to stand pretty much it doesn't matter if you, whatever the situation is whether it's a tall position or a really low position so it's uh you know making sure that they feel comfortable working with those you're not trying to just get them to hold one position i guess too, so. yeah yeah so, yeah. so in, in in that respect puck depth on the ice dictates sort of the the, the approach that, that you'll use for situations so uh, pucks that are entering the zone across the blue line uh, typically you're going to see goaltender standing a little taller still ready still in a safe position but a little taller safe position as that attack nears now they're going to start to settle into a lower position and if the thing ends up uh, you know inside the hash marks and right down on top of the crease now you can see that really deep wide stance that the goaltenders employ to deal with those situations so one size doesn't fit all and uh, typically uh, tall stance in the ready position with a puck at the red line I'm going to give that kid uh, uh, that's going to be giving it his best chance to, to make mistakes. And smaller kids that tend to get ready too early are the ones that tend to have trouble with those drifters, those pucks on the size of the net, and they're stuck down in that low, deep stance, and they have no ability to go to that puck. In reality, if they were just standing a little taller in their ready position or their stance, they would have the ability to react to that puck. And, and so that's generally the case with the smaller kids, and it does apply to some of the bigger boys too. Um, they get over prepared, make themselves small, and the puck is still basically in a perimeter scenario out of the scoring areas. Um, no problem getting into that small, compact, safe posture when the puck's traveled near. But be patient, hold your taller stance when the puck's out of the perimeter. Yeah, okay. Depends on point shots too. If you're trying to you're maybe a smaller guy and you're trying to look around the body, you might be a little bit lower where the taller guy might be able to see above everybody. And then you can stay up a little higher, a little easier, right? Yeah. And that sort of that sort of takes it back to putting your eyes on the puck. If uh, you do have those traffic scenarios, those uh, net presence stuff, tips, screens, rebounds. Um, Pucks on the blue line which still still believe that if they can get eyes on that puck, even if they're standing straight up, it still gives them a better chance of saving rather than just accepting that screen and accepting the traffic and getting to that small or possibly going to the butterfly and getting into that block position. You know, block position in the butterfly is an excellent move, but it's in a sequence of sort of the last thing you do. You don't do it initially. You still try and fight to find the puck with your eyes. And that may be standing tall or looking around. And ultimately, if you can't find it, you're probably going to settle into that butterfly block. But initially, you want to encourage them to find it, fight to find the puck first. And if it doesn't happen, then that's that's a good time for that block position. Okay. All right. That's all I have. Just have one question. Um, one of the concerns I have, or questions, I guess, is from Marco to standpoint just tying in, like, they're going to these early sessions, how do we tie it in without ruining the yogurt that's being done on those two days or whatever? You know, I think everybody wants to, the common thing I hear is, why not go the other one? Like, it's a specialized thing. Um, these sessions have been great, you've heard great feedback. So I think, I think uh, the first part we talked about definitely helps, because now we, some of us maybe cannot think about those five different areas, so we can try and incorporate different views or looks for the goalies, um, but is there anything you can recommend as far as like how much do the goalies know for most sessions? Like is it just a matter of spending some time, say you have 10 minutes, and they know what kind of stuff to work on? Or yeah, is like movements, like movement for example, if we just say go work on your movement, say for a 10 year old, do they know how to do that much from the session? Uh, well for the smaller guys it's more just doing a lot of skating, making sure they can transfer their weight. And they're leading with their eyes, they're making sure they're following rebound. It's not a lot of structure, just more making sure they can 
be on their feet as much as they can, and making sure they can make pushes with proper weight transfer all the time. Where the older guys, they might know a little bit more just from being able to do more stuff. They can transfer their weight, they can move across, we can teach them going into post or going in with the VH, and, and they can work on that. Yeah, a lot of balance stuff. And yeah, so it's not really just it's, it's not really a teaching thing or this is how you want to do it or this is how your plan is. So we're just basically trying to work on their, their movement, right? Um, what we thought we'd do with the ice time today is kind of build a 10 15 minute routine and then at least you'd have some. Because I think, you know, if you, if you get a chance, even if you get the kid, you know, do four or five different movements, even a few passing or, you know, even if you just have them following, pretending to play the puck down the edges, even just when they're skating. Um, that pattern, so it's kind of done with some repetition. I think it's, it's keeping it basic like that. And then as you go through it, yeah, if you, if you shoot the puck with the guy, you want to see him take his eyes to it. You want to make sure he has that angle. You want to make sure he's in a good stance, right? So you know, you could tell. I guess with the stance, if he's if he's in a position where he's locked in, if every time he passes, he has to slide, or if he's so puck focused, he doesn't look. So you know, maybe just having a few things you look for in the stance. But as long as he has a good stance and you think he has proper depth, then it's just up to him to react, so I guess, you yeah, not really over teaching anything, you still want him to kind of be creative and play goal the way he wants to play, right? And there are kids, right? One day they might show up and play like this guy, and the next day they're playing like this guy, and we even have some goalies at the academy and do a little bit of that too, right? But yeah, so it's, I guess, not to structure it too much, I'm not sure if we have that. Yeah, but the, the, the few minutes we'll spend on the ice will we'll give you a, sort of a concept of it. The, the work area and, and honestly it's pretty simple. There's three or four basic skating that we're trying to incorporate. Uh, deep push shuffles, scuttling forwards and backwards and uh, we get creative within those basic pushes but honestly in terms of getting a goalie to, to move, to be to, to improve his agility, balance, and core strength. That's it. And it's, it's really simple now you can get very creative Within those 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 movements, and you can incorporate many different patterns and, and types of drills. But it's a, they work in a small area, and really those are the, the key elements of sort of agility, balance, and, and developing strength. So we'll, we'll we'll give you some good examples of what it is, but uh, it's it's pretty basic. And uh, oh yeah, I don't know if you're sure. supposed to say that. I've got a question with regards to with, the, with regards to equipment and the size of the pads. Yeah. Um, with the littler guys, of course, we supply the equipment, yeah. and I I'm seeing a lot of kids wanting the great big huge pads. And it takes away their mobility in my eyes. Oh, yeah. um, I try to tell them that and the parents that. But the parents then go, oh no, this is what the bond salesman told me I'm supposed to have. And the kids come up with pads that come up past their belly, their belly button. Yeah. What's your, I mean, do you tell me, do we tell these guys, no, get rid of those and get smaller ones or? Yeah. I would because hopefully they can afford it or take them back, right? But yeah, the thing is you gotta think about so if you the more you add up here, the more it's gonna push them out wider, the more it's gonna bring their knees in. You're just gonna lock them in a pretty uncomfortable and unpleasant position, right? So I think they have to change it. Yeah, and there's no way around it. You're not gonna be able to get better wearing those or <clears throat> so how high up are you recommending for those little guys? I think it depends on the knee placement and the pocket. So if they're way at the top and the pads get a little small, where if their knee's kind of sitting at the bottom, then that pad's pretty big for them still. They got a lot of room to grow into it. And then you've got to be plus one, plus two, plus three. Yeah. That's what, more for what, what, like what you're gonna what you're really gonna value is where that where that knee sits in the channel in relation to where that, that pad, the landing pad on the inside of the knee is. If if they're below that pad, then that pad's too big. There, there isn't any necessity for pluses if their knee is hitting on that pad. The moment their knee starts to travel above that pad, then now it's time to consider that plus size of pad. But until that happens, if their knee is hitting that pad properly, then there's, there's no, no reason to go for a bigger size pad. It's 
really a good tell. It's a simple tell. You just put him on his on his knees and look at his knee closer to the pattern. And while you're still fine, it's still the right size. Or it's time to go up the size. Or if you can sew, then you can move it up too. But really yes. Yeah, so. A lot of kids wear knee pads too, right? So they're going to have that part in. But yeah, I don't know. I, I'd, we'd rather have a kid in smaller pads and teach him on skate. Have no big pads to maximize space, right? Mm -hmm. The plus ones are really just for widening your butterfly when you're older too. Like when you're younger, it's going to be hard to get that wide stance and still be able to hold it there with the movement side to side. And for the younger guy, you just want him to have a nice pad with it fits in the knee. You don't need the plus ones that you can really handle the plus one. When you're older, you're a little stronger, right? How much team skating do you make a goalie to participate in? What's a, what's a fair value thing? Because they always want to sit in the net and they don't want to escape. <laughs> well, I think it's more all of that. Like, unless someone's out there working specifically with the goalie, they have that, they should be able to do all that. I'm making my guys do line, so I throw the goalie in there. Yeah, I mean, skate, he should be one of the best skaters on the ice, not? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The thing is, he can do normal skating, or like, you know, when we go to the turkey's practice, or some of the guys, they'll have them do shuffles instead, or they want them to do, you know, C cuts instead of cross over. So I think it's. As long as maybe you add a few things so they were kind of <coughs> similar stuff, but you know, still part of the team, I think that's a good get. I think there's one thing with spacing too is everybody wants their kids to go for a rebound, right? Mm -hmm. Well, if they're going for a rebound, you want a goalie to stop a rebound, but all of a sudden the next wave's coming. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I, I play goal, so I know it often gets overlooked. Yeah. And even a drill that the goalie is not getting a lot of shots, a lot of guys haven't been in the couch for two minutes. <laughs> It takes a lot out of you, right? Mm -hmm. we, we can all agree on that. And a lot of guys that haven't played the position don't know that. So even though, yeah, maybe it's only one shot while they're doing the battles on the corner, but the goalie's doing what he should, he's going to get pretty sore, especially at a young age, right? But I, I think that often gets overlooked. And not a lot of guys are aware of it because <coughs> they haven't had the right same, yeah, yeah, these guys that are forwards are defense and they're not coaching. They've never been in a couch for, for that long, right? Wave after wave, and then those three guys go out of the break, and then they're back in the corner. And here it comes again for the goalie, and you've got a 10 second break while the guys yeah. switched out type of thing, right? There is, there is a way to manage that, that post shot program, and uh, oftentimes coaches just, the drill doesn't end after you shot the puck. Yeah. There's, a, there's a recovery point where you shoot the puck and you recover to another point, so you take them, yeah. you take them away from the net. With energy, and that's the finish line. Let's say, okay, you have to get to the blue line. The drills over when you all recover the blue line. Yeah, that's one example. The other is strictly on the whistle. Every every rep goes off the whistle. That that can fit sometimes. It's tiresome after a while to hear all that whistle. But that's another way to control your spacing and tempo is do your drills on a on a whistle. So a rebound can be played up from time to time, but then a whistle sort of ends that one because another rep is going to be on, on the whistle. So that can be that can be another tool that you can use to create a little spacing for the shooting rows. I think just knowing your kid too, right? Like if you're down there close enough to know how much they can take for that day, right? The thing is you want them to push through stuff. Yep. But there's no question there, right? But you also don't want them to put them in a bad position where they're too tired, they get too sloppy or they're over, you know, reaching the point where you're concerned about them, right? So I think it's just, yeah, watching your individual goalie and knowing what you can take, right? And knowing when you think you can push them through and want them to push through and knowing when you need some minute to have a drink of water and then maybe you bring the other guys in and tell them, okay, on this one, we're gonna try this and do that, right? So you get some a little bit of a break, right?